Good day, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we're looking at what a grocery store in Waterloo and the John Deere new generation tractors have in common. So let's get into this video. Now I know some people already guessed it, but in today's video, we're gonna be covering the design process and engineering of the John Deere new generation tractors. For this story to begin, we have to go back to 1950. And in 1950, the average farm was 213 acres. Now this seems relatively small on today's standards. But everyone knew that population was growing and more food was going to be needed. And this all added up in 1953 with John Deere needing to make a decision. In complete secrecy, they decided to go away from the two-cylinder tractors. And it would stay secret for seven years. This decision was made by Charles Wyman, who at the time was president of John Deere. Wyman would be the great-grandson of John Deere. And he began his career in 1915 as a line employee, making 15 cents an hour. As he began to work his way up through the company, he would also join the army and serve in World War I. As the years went on, in 1928 he was appointed president of John Deere. He would also go on to serve in World War II. But now back to 1953, where Wyman told his designers and developers that he wanted a completely new machine, only keeping one thing the same and that was to keep the iconic green and yellow paint scheme. Now this would be a very risky decision to go on and terminate the John Deere two cylinders, but it was really a decision that had to be made to keep John Deere on top. Now in 1955, Wyman would pass away, leaving his son-in-law, Bill Hewitt, to become John Deere's new CEO. Hewitt would keep Wyman's dream alive of seeing the new generation of John Deere's kicking the project into overdrive. The development would then be put under direction of Merle Hansen, who assembled a team of engineers as they begin to work in an empty grocery store in Waterloo. And this grocery store is where we'd see the design of some of our favorite features on the 30 and 40 tens, which would lead to the 4020s and 3020s. Now the first thing they did when they got the keys to this new grocery store was black out all the windows. There was also some talk of a new bar opening up in the area, and John Deere even went so far as to circulate a petition against it. Now to build a tractor from the ground up is no easy feat, especially in seven years. John Deere had to redesign nearly everything on these tractors, from engines, hydraulic systems, transmissions, electrical systems, and operating platforms. Now as hard as it is to believe, some early drawing concepts depicted yellow tractors with stainless steel inserts, and even some brown style tractors. They initially wanted to have this new design of a tractor, released by 1958, but as they got delayed, it was apparent that this wasn't going to happen. John Deere then went on to redesign some of their 20 series, giving us the 30 series, which would be the 530, 630, and 730 to fill the gap before the new generation. Now in this old abandoned supermarket, many engineers gave it the name Meat Market. And it's even said, some high level executives were turned away at the door. One cool and little known fact is about an engineer who helped define computer history. And this engineer decided after working all day that he'd drive three hours to spend his nights in Moline, Illinois. He would stay at the headquarters where they'd have computers harnessed for precise work. And with this computer, they'd go on to write the first ever computer program written specifically for gear design. Another big focus of these new generation tractors was the hoods. Now this task would be given to Henry Dyfris, who is a famed and well-known sketch artist. He's best known for his help on the A's and B's, drawing up what would become the styled version of those tractors. He also helped redesign the Leaping Deer, and in the mid-50s, he came up with a drawing that you can see a lot of resemblance to the new generation of John Deere tractors. One of the hardest designs on this project was the engine. They had to design something from the ground up. To make these new engines, it costed around $70 million in today's dollars, and a screw up here would have set the project back years. But the engineers hit it off perfect creating some of the greatest four and six cylinder engines around, a lot still in use to this day. Another thing that was starting to come a long way at the time was hydraulics. John Deere needed to redesign a brand new hydraulic pump. They were able to do this and with such a good design, 
The basis of it was used up until the 90s. John Deere would use a closed center hydraulic system, and this would be a lot more economical, meaning that the pump would only work upon demand. And at the time, this was unheard of, and according to Deere, it only took a horse and a half away from the engine. John Deere would go on to pioneer this system, and a lot of companies have followed in their footsteps. Along with improving the power steering, these tractors would also feature hydraulic power brakes, which at the time was a huge upgrade from the two-cylinder brakes. Now to keep this project in complete secrecy, this was really impressive. John Deere would have to cover the prototype tractors as they were hauling them out to test fields in Waterloo, Texas, Arizona, and California. Now on some early models, the PTO lever was on the left side of the console, and this worked fine until a high up executive dismounted from the left side, hooked his suit coat on the PTO lever, and tore it right open. Another thing that's overlooked today was standardization of manufacturing parts. John Deere wanted to make these new generation tractors so that any country with a Deere & Company factory could read the blueprints and be able to produce them. All this secrecy would finally come to an end in 1960. It would be a historic day in Dallas, Texas, with more than 6,000 people in attendance. At noon on August 30th, Deer leader Bill Hewitt's wife cut the bow on a giant package. Inside this package was a 3010 John Deere. This would be the first time the world would ever see one. Now at Deer Day in Dallas, the 3010 wasn't the only tractor showing off. The whole new generation lineup, which consisted of the 1010, the 2010, the 3010, and the 4010 model. With almost 95% of all the parts on these machines being built specifically for the new line, it shocked the world. No one had ever seen anything like it. To put into terms how big this tractor was for Deere, in the years leading up to the release, John Deere controlled about 23% of the whole tractor market. And only two years after the release, this number climbed up to 34%. Some of the biggest draws to these new tractors was higher RPMs, better horsepower, a sleek new design, and convenient controls. One of the biggest things that changed comfort-wise was John Deere tractors previously had the seat right above the rear axle, which when you'd hit a bump, it would transmit it up to the operator. John Deere decided to move the seat just to the front of the front axle giving the operators more comfort. With the release of the 4010s in 1960, they sold for around $4,100. John Deere would go on to run this first set of new generation tractors up until 1963, when they'd give them an even bigger update. 64 would see the release of the 20 series, bringing us one of the most iconic and well-liked tractors of all time, the John Deere 4020. This would be a very successful tractor for Deere, going on to sell nearly 190,000. The main competition for these new generation tractors would be the International 806 and 856. In the day, this sparked many arguments on which tractor was better. Other farmers even argued about 1206s and 1256s. But I'm curious, let me know down in the comment, what's your favorite tractor? Which ones you've operated? And which one you'd pick if you were starting a farm in those days? That old meat market grocery store that's seen the most game-changing John Deere innovations is a daycare today and goes down in history as one of the most top secret spots in all of agriculture design and innovation. With a truly blank page design, John Deere did a phenomenal job designing these tractors. And that's all I got for today. I'd like to thank you guys for watching this short history of the production and design of the new generation John Deere's. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, and if you don't mind, click subscribe. It really helps a lot. Anyways guys, thanks for watching, we'll catch you in the next video.